Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I'll try not to, and putting off your dinner, I'll try not to bore you. Um, this is, for those of you who are around this afternoon, um, this is going to be a shift from what we've been talking about. Um, and for most of you, you may not really know what it is I'm going to talk about. Um, but um, I'm going to tell you a bit about a project that we're doing that's funded by the Norwegian Research Council. Um, and the aim is um, what the title says, supporting informed healthcare choices in low-income countries. But I'm going to talk to you about some work we're doing to try to teach children, um, young children, um, to assess claims about the effects of treatments. Um, so uh, here's an example of a question that I'll come back to later. Um, and you guys can all write down your answers and ask each other what you think. Um, so Dr. Matoki says, last night I had diarrhea. I treated it with a mixture of lemon and cold milk and it stopped. I, recommended this I recommend this mixture for you the next time you have diarrhea. So do you all know what a multiple choice question is? You remember. So here's the question. Is this a reliable assessment of using a mixture of lemon and cold milk to treat diarrhea and why? A, yes, it clearly worked for this person. B, yes, because Dr. Matoki is a trained doctor. C, it's not possible to say yes or no without knowing more about Dr. Matoki. D, no, because we do not know how the lemon and cold milk mixture would work. Or E, no, because the assessment is not based on a fair test. So everybody got an answer? We'll come back maybe if there's time at the end and discuss your answers, but we'll keep going right now. So the problem is that um, people in low-income countries and people here as well were bombarded by claims about things that affect our health every day in advertisements, in newspapers, on the internet, on television, when we talk to friends and family, from doctors, from all sorts of people are telling us things that are going to affect our health, whether it's to prevent something, whether it's to treat a problem that we already have, um, whether it's something that is risky for our health and they're telling us we should avoid it. Um, we're bombarded with these sorts of messages. And some of them are true, and some of them are false. Um, and many of them are unsubstantiated. In other words, we don't know whether they're true or false. And the problem with all these unsubstantiated claims about treatments is that they're often wrong. And as a consequence, people suffer unnecessarily, and resources are wasted by doing things that do not help and sometimes are harmful, or by not doing things that do help because of all these conflicting messages that we're bombarded with. And while this is a problem for all of us, it's even a bigger problem in low-income countries where you have bigger health problems and fewer resources to use. So here are some of the things that um, people think about when they're looking at claims about the effects of treatments. Um, often we're given the impression or we assume that things have dramatic effects. Um, and the cartoon here is saying, well, nurse, quick, flip a coin to see if I should stop the bleeding. Now, this is used sometimes as sort of a ridicule. Well, do we really need to test this? And clearly, you don't. And the reason you don't need to test this is that it's pretty obvious that if you don't stop the bleeding from somebody who's bleeding severely, they're going to die. All right? And, there's, so, and if you stop it, many of the people who would have died will live. It's a very dramatic effect. It happens immediately, the outcomes. And you don't need to do a difficult test to figure that out. The problem is there are very few things that we do, very few of these treatments we're being told about have those dramatic effects. Most things have moderate effects, if they have an effect at all. And many of the things that we're being told about have good effects, have bad effects, as well as good effects. And they all have costs. Now, a lot of times, these um, um, claims about treatments are based on theories. Um, an example is um, um, oral rehydration therapy for um, kids who have diarrhea. Um, um, uh, the idea is very 
good. It's clear that you give fluids to somebody, to little kids who have lost their fluids, um, and they do better. Um, and that is pretty clear. Um, but the, the theory was that um, you should give these kids um, uh, fluids that are high osmolar fluids, and that would help them retain them more. And it makes sense. It's a good theory based on the biology. The problem was um, when um, uh, it took a long time, a couple decades, for, for the test of this theory to be done, um, despite it being recommended around the world by um, WHO, by UNICEF, by experts. Um, and what the test showed when people compared high osmolar solutions to low osmolar solutions was that, in fact, the low osmolar solutions did better. And so the theory was great, but in practice it didn't work. And in fact, Paul Garner, who's sitting here, is one of the culprits who finally summarized this evidence um, that was out there but hadn't been summarized in a systematic way um, to help turn this around and change the recommendations that were being made based on a theory without looking, without really testing that. Tradition, a lot of times we do things because they're a tradition. Um, uh, an example here is um, um, antenatal care where pregnant women go for regular checkups to prevent bad things from happening. Um, um, traditions in many countries were that women should do this 12 times. Um, and that's a burden when you have health systems that are struggling to deliver care. It's a burden on the women uh, to get to these checkups. Um, and, and it was just based on a tradition. There never was really a good, um, even a good theory um, for that. Um, uh, and, it, and when this was tested, it was in fact found that four visits are is just as good as 12, and in fact might be better if you focus that time by doing things that have been shown in tests to be effective to help women and prevent bad outcomes um, from the pregnancy. Often we base things on opinions of experts or authorities, and these may be all sorts of authorities. It may be um, your mother or your grandmother. It may be a doctor. It may be a professor. It may be the government. Um, um, and there's all sorts of different experts and authorities. Of course, the problem here um, is that uh, different experts have different opinions, and it's pretty hard to decide which claims to believe and which ones not to believe based on somebody's expertise, what school they come from, or what their pedigree is. Um, the, uh, um, uh, an example of this, um, uh, magnesium sulfate uh, is, well, let me start with the problem. So eclampsia is something that uh, happens. It's very rare now in the UK. It still happens um, in, in low-income countries. 50,000 women a year still die from this, and it's when women when they're pregnant, they get high blood pressure, they get protein in their urine, and then they have seizures, and many of them die. And there were very strong opinions from experts around the world. The problem was some of these experts were saying that you should use diazepam, a particular drug in one part of the world. Um, in India, they were saying you should use a cocktail of drugs, that uh, toxolytics, to prevent the seizures. Um, uh, they were using uh, um, magnesium sulfate in some place, a very simple, inexpensive drug that um, costs almost nothing. But when um, Ian Chalmers, who's sitting here, and Lilia Dooley and colleagues looked at the evidence, they couldn't find any. Um, and so that led them to do a trial. This was a trial done in, uh, initially in about seven countries. Um, and the trial had to be stopped early because it turned out that the very simple drug, magnesium sulfate, was much more effective than any of the other alternatives, and it was reducing their risk of dying by 50%, cutting it in half. Um, so it was a very effective treatment, but that wasn't sorted out until it was tested. And of course, there's often conflicting interests. We all have competing interests, um, and this becomes a problem when the people who are making claims about treatments um, also um, often make a profit from um, selling us those claims. So, um, using uh, formula instead of breastfeeding in low-income countries um, uh, was a huge problem for a long time. It still is some places um, where these uh, where formula is being uh, marketed when, in fact, um, breastfeeding is much better for the infant um, up to at least four months. And there's risk with uh, giving the formula because um, uh, if you mix it with unclean water, you have problems. Uh, in addition, plus the cost. Uh, the caption here, which you probably can't read, um, is saying that uh, uh, Fifi and her baby at home in Jakarta and in Indonesia were spending uh, uh, half of her husband's salary to buy the formula. Um, so um, clearly conflicting interests. And this is 
also true for many pharmaceuticals. Another problem uh, is we sometimes assume that um, new or more expensive is better. Um, uh, so uh, the picture here is showing you a very old drug for uh, people who have hypertension, hydrochlorothiazide, um, which is in fact probably still the most effective treatment. Um, uh, but people assume that the newer antihypertensive drugs must be better. Um, they cost more and uh, they come in nicer packages. Um, to the extent where, and even in a country like Norway, um, it, there's, it's sometimes difficult to get the hydrochlorothiazide because nobody makes a profit from it. It's not new, it's not more expensive. And more is better. Um, uh, so because antioxidants do something good, lots of them uh, should help us. In fact, they may even be harmful and they're probably not helpful, but they're being marketed even on uh, cans of soda pop. Um, and vitamins, um, we need vitamins, but taking um, vitamin pills um, um, has little benefit, sometimes can have harms unless you have a particular need to be taking vitamins. So the problem is to avoid being misled, we need to test the effects of treatments. None of these assumptions or bases for treatment, claims about treatments are reliable. Um, and uh, we need to uh, test uh, how effective they are, how safe they are, what are the adverse or bad effects they have, and how much they cost is important too. And to do this, it requires having a comparison. For example, comparing what happens with the treatment to what happens without the treatment, or it may be comparing one treatment to another. But tests of treatment can be misleading if they're not fair tests. So, if, a te if the test isn't fair and like isn't compared to like, it can give you the wrong answer. It won't tell you, uh, it won't give you a good uh, assessment of what the effects of that treatment are. It's also a problem if we don't understand the results. If you're going to use these tests to make decisions, then you need to understand what the results mean. It's going to be a problem if you don't understand the, play, the role that the play of chance can have and the risk of being misled by the play of chance. And it's a problem if, the, uh, if we're only measuring indirect markers of disease and not the things that we're actually worried about because often those things don't predict what actually is going to happen to people or if the tests are irrelevant in other ways. If they're done in animals and we're trying to make uh, judgments about what's going to happen in human beings. <clears throat> and it's a problem if we don't consider all of the reliable evidence. If we just look at the ha study that happened to get picked up on in the newspapers or the newest study um, or the uh, one study that happens to get reported and we don't look at all of the evidence, um, uh, that can mislead us too. So to assess claims about treatment effects, we need to be able to do all of these things. We need to recognize what the basis of a claim is, and in particular, ask the question whether it's been tested. We need to know if it has been tested, whether it's a fair test. We need to assess the fairness of tests of treatments. We need to understand the role of chance in understanding uh, when looking at the results. We need to consider all of the reliable evidence from the test uh, from a reliable test of that treatment. And we need to be able to understand the results, and we need to be able to assess the relevance of those results to the decisions that we're going to make. So this is where we started out. Um, and thinking through this, we developed a set of concepts that are um, summarized in those six questions. And we came up with 30, about 31 concepts that we think are important for people to understand if they're going to be able to assess claims about treatments. And then we, uh, and we went through a process to identify those concepts and to agree on them and to try to explain them in plain language. Um, and then we looked at which of these are reasonable to teach to young children, and we took out about eight of them which we thought were really not, um, um, uh, we wouldn't make sense to try to teach to young children. So we ended up with 23 concepts. And here's a couple of examples. So one is that personal experiences or anecdotes, stories are not a reliable basis for determining the effects of most treatments. Um, and the reason for this is we often believe improvements in health problems, for example, recovering from disease, are because of a treatment. However, we don't know what would have happened without the treatment. 
And so it's very difficult to attribute whatever happened to the treatment unless it's something very dramatic like the um, 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 bleeding uh, when you're going to bleed uh, uh, severely. Our, another concept is apart from the treatments being compared, the groups being compared need to be similar. That is, like needs to be compared with like. And the idea here is that people in the treatment comparison groups are different in ways other than the treatments being compared, then whatever apparent effects there are of the treatment might reflect the differences in those groups rather than the effects of the treatment. So these are examples of the sorts of concepts that we're going to try to teach children. So why, why children and why young children in particular? Well, there's a few reasons for this. One is um, helping children to make choices is, in fact, a critical goal for education generally and health education specifically. It's spelled out in curriculums in many countries. Um, and young children are, in fact, able to understand the basic concepts like the ones I've just told you um, that are necessary to assess claims about treatment effects. And teaching science in primary education can um, produce the foundations for a scientifically literate population. And in low-income countries in particular, it's possible to reach a very large segment of the population because a lot of kids drop out of school after primary school. Um, and so you have the opportunity to reach all these kids in a situation where um, uh, there are opportunities to interact and to teach. Um, and it can have an effect on the whole community because often schools play a role in the community um, um, beyond just teaching the kids. And so it involves the teachers, the parents, families, other people in the community. So here's just a little bit of um, um, support for what I was arguing. Um, curricula, these are curricula from a few countries where I've highlighted um, um, what they include that's relevant to um, what we're talking about now. So in the UK, um, um, uh, children, this would be um, uh, children around 10 to 12, um, make links, uh, should be able to make links between ideas and to explain things using simple models or theories. They apply their knowledge and understanding of scientific ideas to familiar phenomena, everyday things, and their personal health. And in terms of scientific thinking, they should be able uh, critically analyzing and evaluating evidence from observations and experiments. So. Some of you who are closer to primary school, do you remember learning these things? No answer. <laughs> I don't. Um, so uh, the other thing is um, we, we sort of as a proof of concept, we went into some schools and we said, uh, well, let's see how much of this kids understood. Um, and I did this the first time actually a long time ago with my own kids when they were about 10 years old here. Um, we went to an international school in Oslo. So these are kids from around the world. And we took a bag of candies, and we told them that the, um, the bright colored candies that the older kids in the school had found out that they help them study better, and they can draw straight lines, and they get a good feeling in their body. But uh, they also, some of the kids would get a stomach ache, and they get dizzy if they stood up too soon. And we told them, they got to figure out, is that, you know, is that right or wrong, you know, the, what, the, what they're being told. And so uh, here you see them at the beginning where they um, start out, they just eat some candies. Um, and they all, some of them get dizzy, and some of them get stomach ache. Um, um, but then you start talking about it, and they very quickly understand, well, they forgot to do a comparison. Um, or they looked at the candies they're eating. Um, and so within an hour, um, it's actually possible for these kids to design their own tests, their own experiments, to actually test this out. And so you, here you see kid who's figured out blinding, it may be a placebo effect. It may be that they know knowing which color they're eating is going to have an effect. Um, they figured out about fair comparisons. Um, uh, and they figured out about chance by tossing coins. And they figured out things could happen by chance. And the picture you see uh, with all the numbers, that's the results from each group, um, where you can see that in some of the groups, they actually found uh, apparent effects. Um, but when you summarize all of the reliable evidence, I'm not sure all of it's equally reliable, but across all of these comparisons, they found out that, in fact, these things happened, whether, whether you ate the dark ones or the bright ones, uh, it may have nothing to do with the candies at all. Um, and they were able to um, describe what they'd done uh, and find out that ah, the kids in high school didn't know what they were talking about 
um, and, and that they, uh, it's important to do a test. Of course, that's a pretty different situation than in a low-income country when we um, tested it out in Uganda in a couple of schools. Um, um, there are a lot of differences. So uh, here you see um, a lot more kids, a lot less space, a lot fewer resources. Um, and they'd never seen these sorts of candies before. Um, uh, we got them in a grocery store there, but in one of the schools they were worried that we were experimenting on them with things that might hurt them. Um, and we had to explain that they were actually just candies. Um, but they also figured out about blinding. They also figured out a chance. They understood this. It varied. Um, here you'll see that in this particular group, they were kids from very young kids to older kids. Um, and clearly, some of the younger kids um, uh, were too young to understand some of what we were talking about. But most of them were able to understand these ideas. Um, and here's at the, another school. And here you see another challenge in these schools. Um, in this classroom, there's 70 to 100 kids in a class with uh, one teacher, sometimes two, um, and getting them to do these sort of small group activities and to challenge authorities is something very different than what they're used to. Um, but it worked, and they enjoyed it. And in fact, in this group, um, you can't really see them here, but in the back of the room, there's four boys who um, um, they ate up all the candies as soon as they got them. <laughs> and, and then when we were collecting the, the results afterwards, um, they made up results. And the first time they did it, they made up results where they um, said that they had some, uh, some of the outcome. And they very quickly figured out that that was a mistake. If they just said there were no events, um, which they did for the rest of the data collection, it wouldn't influence the data and they wouldn't get caught out. So they, even these kids learned something. Um, and, and they all learned something about problems with cheating on tests, which also <laughs> happens, scientific fraud. So then, how should we uh, teach children about fair test or treatment? So, um, this was one way of doing it, um, uh, and, uh, but uh, maybe it's not the best way. We, we uh, together with colleagues uh, uh, in Uganda, so um, we're collaborating with, um, uh, there's a partnership with people at Makerere University in Kampala and with uh, Ian Chalmers at the James Lind Alliance here. Um, and uh, they formed a network of teachers um, and have been meeting with them to get their input. And the first thing that they found out was that none of these teachers themselves had learned these concepts. They were all new concepts for them. And, uh, uh, but they were all very excited and felt you know, not only were these important for them to learn, but important for the kids to learn. Um, and then we had a just brainstorming workshop where they came up with all sorts of ideas about how, how might we do this and started to create prototypes. And so here you see one of the groups um, starting to come up with ideas and putting them uh, onto post-its and organizing them and then sharing the ideas and coming up with lots of different ideas. And so that's what we've been doing now, having developed these concepts, start to brainstorm. So this is the creative fun part and working with designers uh, uh, who help us to do this work to figure out, well, how do we do this? And from working with the teachers there and, and our own thinking and developing ideas, we've come up with some principles that are guiding our thinking about, well, how should we do this? And the first thing is we feel like learning should be fun, um, that uh, kids learn better uh, when things are fun. They're more likely to participate. Um, and this means things like games or activities or game-like activities that involve using or learning the key concepts. Um, with a progression from level to level. So probably all of you are familiar with internet games where you go from level to level and how that captivates um, people's interest. And in fact, there's lots of people working uh, internationally on using games to teach. Um, so um, this isn't new, but it is new doing it for this particular, this particular area. Um, secondly, we felt like um, it sh shouldn't be need for long directions or instructions. Um, nobody reads instructions uh, for games, and if you need long instructions, the game won't get played or they uh, won't work well. Um, that uh, we should use simple and expensive materials. So while it's easy for us in Oslo to use color printers and double size printing, uh, lots of the schools that we're working with don't have printers or they can't print in color if they do have a printer on two sides. So we have to think about the resources that are available. 
Um, that, and, and here we've um, discussed and I think reached some agreement, although at first some of us were much more collaborative than others. Some thought these should all be competitive games and others thought they should be collaborative. But part of games really is there's always competition, but the competition doesn't need to be between individuals. It can be between groups or between schools or it can be between the kids in the game. Um, and so um, um, as making it collaborative, but also um, keeping the competitive element, but deciding how to, um, whether the competition's with um, groups or schools or against the game. Um, and winning should not be based on luck. So we don't want this to be, do you all know what snakes and ladders is? Where um, these games, it's just luck. Um, there's no skill or uh, judgment involved. Uh, and they're very boring. Um, and so we're trying not to make boring games. Um, uh, I should tell you, one of uh, my colleagues who's a, a very experienced, good um, information designer told her uh, daughter what we're doing, and her daughter just moaned and said, oh, no, not another boring government game. <laughs> <laughs> but we're trying hard not to do that. Uh, and it should be possible to play it at home as well as at the school, because I talked about one of the things we want to do is involve families. And obviously, kids this age aren't going to be making their own choices for lots of the things, these treatments, but they're going to talk with their parents and interact. Um, and we want to uh, involve the community in this. And of course, it should be culturally appropriate and possible to adapt it um, um, to different cultures. So here are just some quick, these are early sketches, nothing close to uh, what this will end up like. Um, but uh, what you see in the picture is, um, Professor Fair, um, who uh, he hates unfair tests, um, and he's always busy trying to sort out um, the bullshit and determine uh, which uh, treatments, in fact, which tests are fair and which are, and which claims we can believe and which we can't. Uh, and he has kids who help him. Um, and so these characters um, will be developed and run through the games. And there'll be a series of games and activities that progress. And the levels aren't so much like skill levels, but uh, concepts that build on each other. So the first level is just being able to ask a testable, what is a testable treatment question uh, to understand what we're talking about, and then recognizing the need for testing, understanding the results of tests, understanding the role of chance, judging whether a test is fair, designing fair tests, considering all the evidence, and making judgments about whether evidence is relevant. And so this is sort of the progression we have in mind right now for how these games might work. So here's a, an example to sort of illustrate this. So this is the introductory material. So here's Professor Fair, uh, and he's, uh, this is trying to learn about, well, what is a testable treatment question? So, well, first of all, what do we mean by a treatment? Uh, so a treatment we're using to describe any sort of healthcare intervention. Um, and it's something we can change or do to ourselves or other people, or at least in this illustration, to something. And what's in a test or an experiment? It's a test of the effects of something that can be changed on an outcome that can be measured. And so it means you need to have something, that uh, the treatment, which is what we can change or compare, and you need to have an outcome, which is something we can measure. Um, and so then you can go through a series of these. I won't take you through a whole series, but here's just starting out with a very simple example that's not a treatment in the sense of a healthcare treatment. Um, and, and you could ask, does changing the height of the ramp affect the speed of a car going down the ramp? And so what's the outcome that you're measuring here, and what's the treatment? And you can go on from this to other examples. And, uh, and then the game here is starting out with um, examples that we've made up, and so we've played this game ourselves and learned some things already playing it, um, and we'll start playing it with other kids soon. Um, and then just sorting out which of these are uh, a, a, a testable treatment question and which ones aren't, uh, and what's uh, the treatment and what's being measured, and putting them in the right slot. And then from this, you can go on to a next round where they can make their own questions and sort those and play a similar sort of game. Um, and part of the games can be, particularly when it's learning about fair tests, doing their own fair tests. And it doesn't need to be on candies the way we did. So it can be things you do in gym class. Um, so if you were doing it here, you might want to compare running with two different brands of shoes. 
um, uh, in Uganda, it might be running with shoes compared to running without shoes and see if it makes any difference on how fast you go. Um, are there lots of other things that you can do related to washing hands or activities um, to design fair tests and learn about what it is that makes the test fair um, and, and doing the test? And then at the end, they, uh, the uh, games get a bit more complicated and challenging. Um, have I used up my extra five minutes or yet? Okay, I got to wrap up. And here, you, the questions might be more like the one I showed you at the beginning and getting around the board game to win. So um, I'll end with this. Uh, how will we know what the effects are of Professor Fair and the games? Uh, well, first off, we're going to do user testing. Um, so this is a qualitative approach to assess the, um, uh, whether uh, the, the games work the way with, with the, we think they should, whether they're useful. Um, whether they're usable by the people that we want to use them, the teachers and the kids, understandable, uh, whether they have credibility, whether they find them desirable, and whether they identify, they feel like these are things that were designed for them, that, uh, that work for them. And then we're going to do a fair test of these games. So we'll randomize, we'll divide schools by chance to make sure we have a fair comparison, similar schools. Uh, uh, and uh, half of the schools will get these games and they'll go through them over a year, um, going through the different levels, uh, and the other half won't, and will measure their ability to apply these concepts and the change from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Uh, and we'll also measure what happens a year later, whether they've retained any of this or what's happened a year later, as well as seeing if there are any changes in the community. And lastly, we'll do adaptation and user testing in Kenya and Rwanda, uh, and possibly here in the UK and in Norway as well, to see if these things work in different contexts. I'll stop there. Sorry for taking too much time.